This is going to be something of a Cinderella story. People often assume that Jane Austen has always been celebrated, that she must have been wildly popular in her own time as she is now. But when it comes to the literary canon, well into the 20th century, she was like her heroine Fanny Price, occupying the East Room of Mansfield Park without a fire to warm her, still a niche taste. Abbotsford, the home of Walter Scott, the novelist who crushed all opposition when Austen was publishing, was open to the public in 1833. Haworth Parsonage, home of the Bronte sisters, went public in 1928. The literary societies for Scott, Dickens and the Brontes are all more than a century old. The first meeting of the Jane Austen Society, a group of seven people gathered in, Aust in Alton near Chawton, took place on 29th of May 1940 in the midst of a national crisis. Janine Barkas has drawn my attention to the fact that the evacuation of Allied troops at Dunkirk was unfolding at that very moment. The aim of the society was to raise funds to buy and preserve Jane Austen's former home, which had become a dilapidated tenement building. Some at the time thought this was not only impossible, but irrelevant. One of the founders recalled, we were told on all hands that if such a scheme could ever exist, it must be postponed indefinitely. Yet they persevered and the result is recorded in a plaque outside Jane Austen's house that records the opening of the cottage to the public in 1949. A great deal of thought must have gone into this inscription. In the biggest lettering it records, above all, the huge emotional investment made by Thomas Edward Carpenter when he decided to purchase and help bring about the restoration as a museum of the cottage where Jane Austen once lived. It also commemorates a PR triumph, persuading a major figure in the social and political establishment, the Duke of Wellington, to serve as president for the budding Jane Austen Society and open the house, gaining maximum publicity at a time of relatively fixed social hierarchy and deference. Only at the bottom do we find the founder of the society and that date, 1940, nine years before the opening of the house, the year that we're commemorating in 2020, in the Jane Austen Society's 80th year. Unlike the men, she has no title, no institutional connections to flourish. She is simply of Alton. She was apparently the most modest and self-effacing of women. We know very little about her. Yet when the wording of the inscription was being decided, there must have been gentle insistence that her name appear there solo as the founder, and 1940, not 1949, should be recorded as the point of origin, in memory of the small gathering at which it was decided to launch a new literary society. We shouldn't think of her as an afterthought on the plaque. She is the main driver, the foundation of it all. I'd like to speak a little about the collaboration of these four people. They had one key thing in common. They didn't like having their photo taken. I gather this from the difficulty I've had finding a decent shot of three of them. Elizabeth Jenkins is very glamorous here. This is one of four portraits owned by the National Portrait Gallery. She was a professional writer, a well-known biographer and, nove and novelist, and probably forced to have something done for publicity purposes. But we know she hated images of herself. When the Virago Press came to publish her classic 1954 novel, The Tortoise and the Hare, the author image was replaced with a cipher at her request. I'm quite sure this dislike of coming forward was part of their affinity with the notoriously retiring Jane Austen, who insisted on publishing anonymously. Another thing the three women had in common with each other, and with Jane Austen, none of them married. Indeed, Dorothy and Beatrix were sisters who, with a third unmarried sister, set up together in a house called Jordan's just outside Alton in the early 1930s. After Elizabeth's death in 1946, Dorothy and Beatrix moved to Brook Cottage, Lenton Street, near the centre of town, devoted to each other like Jane and Cassandra. Beatrix didn't cherish quite the same passion for Jane Austen as Dorothy, but she had no choice about joining in. Dorothy declared, I must have Beatrix because I couldn't get on without her. Beatrix was the society's original treasurer, Dorothy and Elizabeth Jenkins were joint secretaries, and Hugh Curtis was chairman. It all began with a discarded fire grate, according to legend. By the time Dorothy moved to Alton, 
She knew about Jane Austen's connection with the cottage. Before the move, she regularly drove past it unaware on her way from London to visit her parents. Her father, Reverend Daniel Darnell, and mother Elizabeth lived in Portsea in Hampshire, near Portsmouth. Once, when she was halted on her way to the coast by congestion at the crossroad in Chawton before the bypass was built, she asked her an AA guide on duty if the nearby house had been Jane's. Yes, the man exploded. She's the plague of my life. One day in the late 1930s, after the move to Alton, Dorothy was out walking and came across a cast iron grate of the Regency period, which had been ripped from the dining parlour of Jane Austen's house to make way for a fire, gas fire. It had been dumped on a bed of nettles next to a neighbouring forge, waiting to be melted down. She rescued the grate, but what should she do with it? She was told to contact Mr Curtis. He was a man with deep roots in the Alton community, great-grandson of Jane Austen's own apothecary, and honorary secretary, oh, honorary curator of a museum of local history founded by his father. Mr Curtis agreed to house the great. Dorothy's next move was to contact Elizabeth Jenkins, who had just published in 1938 the first research-based biography of Jane Austen. It was between these two that the plan was hatched to start a society. Hugh Curtis was quickly enlisted. Elizabeth Jenkins recalled the afternoon that Dorothy Darnell first spoke to me of her idea of founding a Jane Austen society with a view to making the house at Chawton available to the public, she said, we must get hold of Mr. Curtis. It was probably through him that they were able to get the agreement of Edward Knight to sell the house for 3,000 pounds leading to an extensive fundraising campaign and eventually the involvement of Mr. Carpenter as benefactor. Here is the fire grate, restored in all its glory, along with a great many other objects that were tracked down and retrieved large, largely as a result of the tireless efforts of the first two secretaries, Dorothy Darnell and Elizabeth Jenkins. They wrote numerous letters to the extended Austin family and to auction rooms, exploring every avenue for recovering objects for the future museum. And in the meantime, Dorothy also gathered up every scrap of oral tradition relating to Jane Austen in the vicinity. This was research. The room in the image is at one level a shrine, a collection of relics gathered because of the love of six brilliant novels. And at the same time, it's the product of meticulous research, right down to the recent edition of the authentic wallpaper. Dorothy and Elizabeth were not professional historians or literary scholars, but they had a wealth of what are called now transferable skills, and I'd like to talk a bit about these. If you look for Dorothy Darnell online, you'll find very little. No Wikipedia page, no entry in the Oxford Dictionary of National Biography. Google search will ask if you mean the Hollywood star of the 1940s and 1950s, Linda Darnell. But at one time, Dorothy had a career as an artist, with some success, as you can see. It wasn't a conventional career. She chose to study with the anti-establishment William Nicholson, father of the modern painter, modernist painter Ben Nicholson, who refused to exhibit at the Royal Academy and was a force to be reckoned with in fin de siècle London, living the bohemian life while involved in theatre and pioneering graphic arts and gaining celebrity and eventually a knighthood for his portraiture. Dorothy too went down the path of portrait painting and here's a gorgeous example of her work. It's the portrait of a pioneer, another rare woman who attempted to make her way in the creative arts. Emily Damon was a brilliant scholarship student at the Royal College of Music in the year that it opened, 1883, and went on to gain a Bachelor of Music degree and doctoral degrees at Oxford University, although women were barred from claiming their qualifications until 1920. She taught at the Royal College of Music from 1908 to 1921 and became a research specialist on the music of troubadours. It seems likely that Dorothy came to know her through her sister Beatrix, who also gained an honours degree in music and later worked there. The portrait graces Damon's Wikipedia page and speaks to me of the era, era of the new woman, the suffragettes and Virginia Woolf's A Room of One's Own. 
That was a talk delivered at Cambridge University in 1928. Making this connection, it's no wonder that Dorothy and Beatrix felt so invested in rescuing Chawton Cottage, a place that had once sheltered three independent women from the Austen family, a space that was for Jane a house of one's own, allowing her to restart her literary career. Here's another work by Dorothy Darnell. You can see the influence of Spanish 17th century art, notably Velázquez, here as in William Nicholson's still life painting. Is it fanciful to see something in this careful study of the cleaning of a copper urn, something of the love and care for domestic historical objects that fired Dorothy Darnell's determination to rescue the fire grate, restore it to its place and educate the public about the conditions in which Jane Austen lived and wrote? This image of the grate accompanied an excellent article by one of the stewards at Jane Austen's House Museum. Stephimo, who has volunteered there for many years. It formed part of the 41 Objects exhibition in 2017. My thanks to Susie Gilmore of Jane Austen's House Museum for sending the image and the article. Stephimo remarks, it is fitting that a few months before Dorothy Darnell's death in 1953, the dining parlour at the museum was open to the public with the grate finally restored to its original position. In the quiet of the early morning, it's easy to stand in front of the fireplace and imagine Jane here, key to the tea cupboard in hand and the kettle on the hob. That we have the privilege to do so is down to the tenacity of Miss Dorothy Darnell. Elizabeth Jenkins was a full generation younger than Dorothy Darnell. Her father, a headmaster, encouraged her writing and she went to Cambridge University where she read English and history. She became a prolific author, publishing nine novels and six biographies. I've already mentioned her tendency to self-effacement. This could be extreme. Her first novel, Virginia Water, was published in 1929 when she was 24. And Virginia Woolf, whom she knew, called it in her diary, a sweet white grape. But Elizabeth bought up copies to destroy them. An excise mention of this in her two other earliest works of fiction from her entry in Who's Who. Yet there was also a playful assertiveness in her penchant for bringing forward historical figures called Elizabeth. Her most successful biography, aside from the Jane Austen, was titled Elizabeth the Great. And there was surely a feminist spirit at work in her decision to publish a collection of short biographies of a number of forgotten heroines, defiantly called Ten Fascinating Women. Like Jane Austen in her lifetime, she was a writer's writer. Look no further than this endorsement from Hilary Mantel. At the time Dorothy Darnell got in touch with her, Elizabeth had just moved into a pink-washed Regency house Eight Downshire Hill in Hampstead, where according to her friend the novelist Elizabeth Bowen, she lived in, quote, rather threadbare elegance. During the war years, she stayed in London, working for a number of government departments, including the Ministry of Information. And after the war, she supplemented her slender income from writing, from writing by reading manuscripts um, for the left-wing publisher, Victor Golantz, who brought out her own books. Elizabeth Jenkins was to become the chronicler of the early years of the Jane Austen Society in the pages of its annual reports, but she continued to play down her own role. I would guess because she made use of the new scholarly work on, on Austen's writings coming out of Oxford University and scored a critical success with her biography, that she was responsible for the next step in the development of the society. Elizabeth wrote in Dorothy's obituary in the annual report of the daunting difficulties that stood in the way of her aim. She wanted to make the house a suitable memorial, but, quote, she had no money and no influence and did not see how the thing could be done. Dr. R. W. Chapman and Mary Lassells came on board and started acting both in an advisory capacity and with the clout their authority and the resources of the university could bring. Chapman made a huge impact in the 1920s and 30s with his scholarly editing of the collected works of Jane Austen. 
I must quickly add, though, that one of our speakers today, Janine Barkas, has published a wonderful article about the hidden influence of his wife, Catherine Metcalf, herself a star researcher who had published the very first scholarly edition of an Austen novel, Pride and Prejudice, in 1912 the year this picture was taken, before vanishing into domesticity. Then there was Mary Lassells, a fellow at Somerville College, Oxford, whose critical work, Jane Austen and Her Art, published in 1939, uh, became a classic. Both R. W. Chapman and Mary Lassells agreed to become trustees of the Jane Austen Memorial Trust alongside Mr. Carpenter, Hugh Curtis and Dorothy Darnell. The main objective of the Memorial Trust was achieved in 1949 with the opening of Jane Austen's House Museum to the public. I'm grateful to the museum for this photo. Typically, it's difficult to pin down the identities of the people in it, but we're fairly sure that's um, Dorothy Darnell at the front and Thomas Edward Carpenter on the right. The directors of Jane Austen's House Museum and Chawton House have talked eloquently about the significance of these architectural monuments in their conversation for the recent Literary Lockdown Festival, still available on the Chawton House website, and at today's event. But the creation of the museum was only the beginning for the Jane Austen Society, which took a separate path officially from 1955. Elizabeth Jenkins had already turned her attention to producing an annual report on the Society's plans and activities. The first report, published in 1950, was just eight pages long, but already contained fascinating arch archival work, including historical photos, a list of all Hampshire-born Austens, and a list of plants used in gardening in Jane Austen's time. Let's be honest, annual report is not a name to conjure with, but for many years the journal has been a thing transformed, more of a deluxe limousine than a pumpkin. Today it appears in a glossy cover, contains around 10 research articles annually, colour illustrations and a transcript of the talk by a distinguished speaker at the Society Annual General Meeting, as well as reports from branches of the Society, accounts and on other ongoing business. David Selwyn, a long-time editor of the Annual Reports, who himself produced superb research on Jane Austen, put it very well, if rather too modestly, in the preface to one of the collected volumes. The history of the society is inextricably bound up with the development of research into Jane Austen and might be said to be part of it. On the left, then, is the other house the Jane Austen Society has made available to the public. This is the house that research built. It's become a home for me. And I'll just briefly explain why to give you a very specific and personal example of the value of the reports. Back in 2012, I became intrigued by the fact that one of Jane's brothers, Henry, was a banker, but I could find barely a mention of it in the reams of academic books on the subject of Jane Austen. In the next slide, I'll show you what I found in the annual reports. This list of articles is taken from the bibliography of the book I eventually wrote, Jane Austen, The Banker's Sister. Two names stand out, T.A.B. Corley and Clive Kaplan. Tony led the way in researching the collapse of Henry's bank, referred to in Jane's letters and obliquely in her last novel, Persuasion and the Fragment Sanderton. Tony and Clive Kaplan worked in tandem, exchanging sources and covering an extraordinary span of Henry's activities and involvements. I got in touch with both of them to thank them for their groundbreaking work. Clive was a member of, of JASNA, the Jane Austen Society of North America, a retired medical doctor with a forensic attention to sources. Tony was an economic historian by trade, who retired in 1988 from a post at the University of Reading. He served in the Navy during World War II and for a time worked at the Bank of England, so he was exceptionally well qualified to examine and interpret Henry Austen's career. His love of research overspilled the boundaries of university specialization. 
He lost his wife at a tragically early age and raised four children single-handed. He told me that he first started investigating aspects of Jane Austen's life, including her connections with Reading, when the children were young, as a way of passing the time in the evenings. He was still pursuing research into his 90s and shared documents from unfinished work on Henry Austen's scurrilous secret partner, Charles James. He also gave me a gift which has put me forever in his debt his complete set of Jane Austen Society collected in annual reports. The reports can be purchased individually through the Jane Austen Society website, although editions from a few years are quite scarce. I've now combed through the annual reports again and again, searching for answers to various Jane Austen questions and stumbling across all kinds of delightful serendipity along the way. Articles are both enjoyably readable and rigorous, in part thanks to the involvement of such celebrated Austen scholars as Deirdre Le Fay, Brian Southam and Maggie Lane. The Jane Austen Society of North America also has a terrific journal, Persuasions, in an open access digital edition as well as a print edition for subscribers. I was honoured to be made a trustee of the Jane Austen Society last year. A priority has been making the annual reports freely accessible online, and I'm immensely grateful to the Digital Scholarship Unit at University of Southampton, especially Eleonora Gandolfi, taking, for taking on this project. In the Society's 80th birthday year, the reports have launched. Here is the link and here's a screenshot of the Jane Austen Society annual reports online. This is what it looks like when you arrive at the home page. Now, tea and cakes are an essential part of the existence of a literary society, as are shared love of books and sociability. When I asked fellow trustees of the society what they considered its most important feature, friendship and companionship with fellow enthusiasts got most mentions. But the intellectual stimulus is also highly valued. Our chair, Richard Jenkins, encapsulates these complementary aspects in the phrase, the shared pursuit of serious pleasure. The period following the COVID-19 lockdown seems a good moment to consider this other side to the activity of many societies, not least the Jane Austen Society producing and communicating knowledge beyond academic study as part of a wider ecosystem of lifelong education and research. There should be government investment in lifelong learning, but let's not undervalue the role played by literary societies. People have been doing it for themselves for many years. We need to expand our ideas of what counts as a research community. The annual reports are one excellent reason for joining the Jane Austen Society. Hazel Jones, the current editor, has told me the 2019 annual report available this month is a bumper issue. It won't be transferred, transferred to digital for a couple of years, so it's well worth becoming a member to get a first look at the cutting edge detective work of the sort I've been describing and perhaps thinking of contributing yourself. There's plenty more to be explored. Don't let anyone ever tell you that everything on the subject of Jane Austen has been said. We keep asking new questions and learning more, and this constantly shifts our understanding of the writings. Many of the trustees first got hooked on Jane Austen when very young, at school or when looking for something to do during the holidays. One of them, Elizabeth Proudman, managed to read all six in one summer and remembers, this is quoting her, the black gloom that settled on me when I realised that I had read them all, that there were no more. As she notes, that gloom, which all of us feel at times, can best be relieved by talking and writing about the ones that miraculously exist. Love of Jane Austen brings together different generations, and this is the focus of the Society's educational mission. This year, we're launching an essay competition for graduate students and early career researchers in the UK. I want to end by thanking, first of all, Chawton House for hosting the 80th birthday party. We hope to hold the annual general meeting of the Jane Austen Society in July next year in its traditional spot on the lawn next to Chawton House. 
In the meantime, we're enormously grateful to Katie Childs and her team for the enthusiasm, commitment and expertise that went into providing this virtual lawn on which to raise our digital marquee. Kim Simpson, in particular, has been the fairy godmother who said, you will go to the ball. Thank you, Maureen Stiller, the Honorary Secretary, and to Jane Hurst of the Hampshire branch of the Jane Austen Society for helping me with information about the origins of the Society. And final, grateful thanks to fellow trustees, some of whom have been serving the Society as officers and editors for a decade or more, freely volunteering their time and skills. You do Dorothy Darnell and the other founders proud.